Uh, my name's Steve Layton. I'm a resident of the watershed and a member of the Water Quality Committee. And first, I want to thank Peg Brandon. I don't see her. Is that better? OK. First, I want to thank Peg Brandon, who is the director of SEA, for letting us use this nice space. And I uh, want to introduce the members of the Water Quality Committee. Our newest member, am I doing that? Or is it uh, some rude person with a cell phone? Um, <coughs> The, uh, uh, the newest member of the committee is Tom Duncan, a professor of environmental science. There's Matt Charette, a senior scientist and geochemist at HUI. John Waterbury, an emeritus scientist at HUI and a microbiologist. Ron Zweig, an international aquaculture consultant. Virginia Valiela, the co-chair, couldn't be here tonight. Uh, but Eric Turkington, our chairman, is. He's been a selectman for many years and also a former state legislature, Slator. And I'm also happy to uh, welcome Sam Patterson, one of our selectmen. So I'll turn it over to Eric. This is his tradition. Let's see if we can do this without hanging ourselves. Yeah. Friday night lecture is worthy. <laughs> Someone introduces the introducer. Okay. This is all on behalf of FCTV, who is filming this. Um, well, it, it works for them, but not for us. So we'll, we'll just speak loudly and uh, hope that works. Okay. Um, Yes. Well, that'd be my guest. <laughs> I, I, okay, fine, great. Um, all right, well, while we're getting the chairs, um, I, I want to let you know that Brian Howes uh, from the University of Massachusetts Dartmouth, who did the Mass Estuaries Project, is, is here tonight. Okay, this is going to be a problem. Because I don't think I don't think the mic does it work. Does this better? Does this work for you? Okay, good. Okay, we'll all remember. Speak closely to the mic. Okay, uh, as I say, Brian House from University of Massachusetts Dartmouth S Mass Center. He he led the Mass Estuaries project that got us all here today. Uh, Ed Leonard is is going to present the results of his work on behalf of the town on Oyster Pond and the options that they've looked at and the results they've come to. Eric Karplis is our committee consultant and he is going to pass around a uh, sign-up sheet for anybody who would be willing to sign it. <clears throat> right, and I'm going to give a very brief overview of what, what Falmouth has been doing about cleaning up its estuaries, including Oyster Pond. Um, someone has to do this. <laughs> All right. Falmouth is blessed, if that's the word, with more estuaries than, <coughs> more impacted estuaries than any other town in Massachusetts and probably in the country. <laughs> we have 15 impaired estuaries ranging from McGansett Harbor, Fiddler's Cove, Rands Harbor, Wild Harbor, West Falmouth Harbor, Quisset Harbor, Oyster Pond, Salt Pond, Falmouth Inner Harbor, Little Pond, Green Pond, Bourne's Pond, Eel Pond, Wakoit Bay, and Great Pond. Um, as I say, more than any other town or state, <laughs> in the, town or city in the country. And uh, they're all impacted by nitrogen, which is the reason you, you're seeing the condition that your pond and their ponds are in. Next. Good idea. Good. All right. Back in 2011, the town was offered by its consultant at the time the option of sewering, uh, $600 million worth of sewering. And the town said, you've got to be kidding. We're not doing this. They gave this committee the charge of look at every option, 
except sewering, in, well, including sewering, but look at every option that's available and try it out. Try it out in film, see what works, see what's cost effective. They gave us $2.7 million to do that, and we, we have pursued fertilizer control. Falmouth has the toughest fertilizer bylaw in the Commonwealth. Inlet widening, Bowen's Pond is, is an area where if you widen the inlet, the nitrogen will drop drastically, and we're, gonna, we're in the process of doing that right now. Shellfish cultivation, we've spent a lot of time and money developing the shellfish option because it, it, it's quite clear to everybody that shellfish do reduce nitrogen if you get them in the right numbers in the right place in the right way. So Falmouth has done a lot of that. Permeable reactive barriers, we, we've worked on as a concept. Basically, the concept is stick a barrier of carbon of some sort between underground water that's flowing toward an estuary and the estuary. We have not yet put one on the ground because they're expensive and the regulatory hurdles are enormous, but it, it's on the list of things to keep trying. Nitrogen removal IA systems, which you're gonna hear a lot about tonight because that is an option that has worked. It's worked in West Falmouth and we can talk about that. Uh, and we're hoping that it works in a lot of other places. Finally, we did the what we call a demonstration project, which is we took a water body similar to Oyster Pond and we said, okay, we're gonna sewer it, and we did. Now we wanna see if that works. Little Pond Sewer Service Area is basically the heights in Mara Vista. And if you've all been out there, you know it's a very dense neighborhood. Uh, Little Pond is the, is the water body you can see in the middle there. And it was heavily overloaded with nitrogen. The sewer project has been completed. 1,600 sewer equivalent units, that's basically homes, have been hooked up to the sewer. Project cost $37 million. 70% of that was paid by the owners of the property uh, through the betterment, and 30% was paid by the town through tax dollars. Uh, it was financially less onerous than most sewer projects are for a couple of reasons. Very small lots mean the pipes that you put in the ground can hook up a lot of homes uh, at, at relatively low cost per home. Uh, the other great thing about that area is it was able to connect to the sewer lines that already existed under Main Street and, and so we didn't have to create a whole new sewer line out to the sewer treatment plant. So for those two reasons, uh, the cost per homeowner out there was not inordinate, though they won't tell you that. <laughs> but but it, was reasonably, it was reasonable. It was less than any other uh, betterment uh, for any sewer project uh, in Massachusetts. Uh, it was $16,000 per home. And they got to pay it off over 30 years at 0% interest. Uh, so it ended up costing them $435 a year for the betterment. That is, is it, that will never happen again, anywhere. <laughs> it, it, it just, it was a great combination of factors that made that possible. Uh, but, but that's what happened. So now we're gonna wait and see. That's our demonstration project to see if sewers clean up the estuaries. Uh, so we'll wait and see on that. Next. So we've looked at all the estuaries in Falmouth with a fine tooth comb. We, we figured out that some of them, no matter what you do, sewering is gonna be the only option for those estuaries. And that includes Little Pond, which, which we've done, Great Pond, Green, the west side of Green Pond, Mokoit Bay, and, and Wild Harbor. Um, the good news is that we have a fair number of estuaries in Falmouth that can meet their TMDL, their, their net, the nitrogen load you want to reach, without sewering. And that includes McGansett, it includes Fiddler's Harbor, Rands Canal, West Falmouth Harbor, Quisset Harbor, Oyster Pond, Salt Pond, Falmouth Harbor, and Boynton Pond. Th those are the ones that we're going to attack with, with the, uh, the non-sewering option. Oyster Pond is interesting because you can go either way. And that's what we're here tonight to talk about. Thank you.
Um, I will now bring our consultant, Ed Leonard, up. Uh, Wright Pierce is the name of his company. They've been working on the oyster pond question for three years, four, four years. Uh, yeah, four, I think. And uh, he's here tonight to tell you where, where we've gotten with this and uh, where we need to go. All right, thanks for having me here tonight. Appreciate it. Um, so we had a presentation to at this location a number of years ago uh, to present the initial alternatives analysis, and this, this is the updated alternatives analysis. So this project is driven by uh, the Massachusetts Estuaries Project, TMDL, Total Maximum Daily Load, which in simplified terms is the threshold at which, above which, the water can't really uh, assimilate the pollution that's in it. So in Oyster Pond's case, we're above the threshold, which means we need to reduce nitrogen in order for the water body to, to become healthier. Um, this is a targeted comprehensive wastewater management plan. As Eric said, the town has done significant work town-wide. This is a targeted plan for this watershed only. And the task is to identify the needs, to identify solution, options to address those needs, identify the solutions, and then come up with a plan, a funding, financing, schedule plan to implement it moving forward. Uh, in terms of timeline, we uh, completed the needs assessment in 2013. We presented that to the Water Quality Management Committee at that time. We did the initial alternatives analysis in 2014. We updated that based on a lot of the work the town has done since that in that intervening three years. Uh, that was completed last fall and we presented that to the, to the committee in June and we're here tonight. Uh, the final plan will be put together by December 2019. So there's a number of things that we need to get in hand before we can finish this plan and that's part of what we'll talk about tonight. So Oyster Pond has been studied extensively since 1960, since the 1960s. Um, probably more than any pond I've been familiar with and numerous people in this room know more about Oyster Pond scientifically than I do. Um, it's in big picture terms, it's 63 acres. It's a low salinity uh, brackish pond. Uh, it's variable depth, there's three deep holes in it. And from, from a regulatory perspective, the regulators are concerned about dissolved oxygen in the deepest parts of the pond. That's where the habitat, some of the habitat is and that's what they're trying to protect. So these deep holes play a role in the compliance or the ability to produce compliance in the pond. Going back in time, uh, this, these are originally three freshwater kettle holes. As sea level rose, they became salt water. Then longshore currents isolated that, then it became brackish. Um, that was kind of armored over time with a railroad and surf drive. And so now it's, uh, a weir was installed, you probably all know this, a weir was installed, so it's managed, it's engineered and managed as a low salinity pond. Uh, and, and the pond was listed as impaired by DEP in 2006. Oops. So key issues, um, this is the needs assessment in one slide. Um, there's 225 dwelling units in the watershed. Of those, approximately 70% were built uh, af in the 1970s and more recently. And of those, most are within a 10 year travel time of groundwater to the pond. So the, the load that, it's representative of, of current conditions. Um, we did project into the future how much additional development or redevelopment that could occur in the watershed. We looked at work that was done by MEP as well as the Cape Cod Commission. We settled somewhere in the middle. Uh, it did include a parcel that has since been purchased for conservation, so we need to adjust that. Um, but the future, these numbers are based on uh, the conservation land not yet having been purchased. So in the future, there, there would be 243 dwelling units. It's about a 19% increase and that has an impact on how we can manage the nitrogen for the pond itself. Uh, the water column nitrogen in the pond is fairly variable. 
uh, and that's in part due to some natural phenomenon that happened in the pond related to uh, stratification. Uh, the pond stratifies both based on temperature as well as salinity, and that has an impact again on where, uh, how dissolved oxygen gets to the deeper parts of the pond. Uh, so the fact that these natural things happen naturally uh, is important in the, the remedy for the, for the watershed. All right, so the current load, this, was, this is based on the Massachusetts Estuaries Project work. The report was published in 2006. The current load is 5.2 kilograms per day, uh, or 4,200 pounds per year. And the target load is 1,250 pounds per year. So it's a significant reduction. Uh, of the current load, about 72% is wastewater. About 15% is what falls from the atmosphere onto the water surface itself. And then about 13% is the other pieces of land use. Uh, precipitation that falls on forested land, precipitation that falls on impervious surfaces, as well as fertilizer use. Um, so the plan that we're putting together addresses each of these components and not focusing solely on one. So we're going to reduce the wastewater load by either uh, by some alternative wastewater management strategy, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, as Eric mentioned, the fertilizer reduction program, we're counting on that fertilizer load reducing. Um, we are going to recommend installation of stormwater best management practices, which will reduce the stormwater fraction of that load. Uh, we know from some science that's been done by people, including people in Falmouth, that atmospheric uh, the amount of atmospheric load is decreasing over time, and so we've included that in the analysis. And one really important thing for Oyster Pond is the, is the proper management of the Trunk River, because um, as the longshore current set up, that blocks the outlet of the pond and, and causes problems backwater, basically, into the pond. It becomes too, too much fresh water. So the management of that, that sill is really important. Each of these things are in all of the alternatives that we assessed. We, we, Eric, again, had identified a number of, of non-traditional approaches that, that the Water Quality Management Committee was tasked with looking at town-wide. We did look at those, a similar set of those for Oyster Pond and, and eliminated them for a number of reasons. Um, and then we focused on six what we called composite plans, which ranged from uh, sewering everything to the, to the town's treatment plan on Blacksmith Shop Road to doing the whole watershed with uh, on-site IA systems to no action at all. Uh, based on that analysis, we included a cost evaluation at that time as well. And based on that cost analysis, as well as the advantages and disadvantages of each of those six options, we shortlisted two which is plan one, sewer and send everything to Blacksmith Shop Road treatment plant, or two, deal with it just in the watershed. And I'll talk about those now. So the sewering approach, you basically can, you eliminate the septic system and the leach field, you connect to the sewer, and every bit of nitrogen that came from the wastewater component is gone. It goes to the treatment plant, it gets treated, discharged somewhere else. So it's 100% removed from the watershed. Under current conditions, in order to meet the TMDL, we need to deal with 145 dwelling units. So this is essentially a home. So treetops would be 60-ish dwelling units. A single family home would be one. In the future, to accommodate that growth, we need to increase up to 172 dwelling units. Uh, the total watershed has uh, 224 dwelling units under current conditions. So under current would be 64% of the homes would be sewered, and in the future, it would be 70%. Uh, we'd do that by using a low pressure sewer system, running pipes to the sewer, existing sewers on Main Street, and all that flow would be conveyed by existing town infrastructure to the treatment plant. So from a cost perspective, it's relatively cost effective. Um, the issue is, as Eric mentioned, there's 
uh, a limited amount of disposal capacity at that treatment facility, um, in part because of the permit that exists today and in part because of all the other watersheds that need to be addressed at some point in time. Uh, so that's a, that's a key issue related to Plan 1. <coughs> the other alternative is everybody, essentially everybody in the watershed puts in their own alternative IA system. Um, at what we termed advanced IA system. So this is a system that would produce less than 10 milligrams per liter total nitrogen. Um, a typical system might produce somewhere between 20 to 30 milligrams per liter effluent nitrogen, uh, a typical septic system. So this is a significant reduction and requires a whole different setup in your backyard than a traditional either cesspool or Title V system. In this scenario, basically, everybody needs to, to put in a system. Um, the issues with this approach are that there aren't any systems that are yet approved for general use. This is a DEP term, approved for general use. Um, there's numerous systems, or there are several systems that have some data, or a lot of data, that shows that they can achieve this less than 10 milligram per liter number. Um, but the important thing is to get them to the point where they're approved for general use. Um, the other important thing with, with Plan 5 is the cost associated with proving compliance. Um, with a sewer approach, it's relatively easy. As long as you can confirm that you eliminated the septic system, you've kind of done the math. You're done. In this case, you have 140, 170 units spread out with a whole bunch of different owners that are, some are seasonal, some are year-round, so proving compliance from a regulatory framework becomes a lot more challenging. The town did a, did a bunch of work with DEP and the Mass Alternative Septic System Test Center to come up with a framework to make this much more cost-effective. Uh, and that, those discussions, I think you probably had two or three meetings with, with them now, and that's really the thing that makes us a lot more cost effective, make plan five a lot more cost effective. But it's still an issue that needs to get resolved. So from, this is just the, the summary, um, plan one to plan five. So we did uh, cost estimating. We developed a couple of different cost models. We looked at what would the cost be to address the TMDL under current conditions, and then we had a separate cost estimate for what it would be with that future development. Uh, we looked at it from a capital cost perspective and an O&M operations and maintenance perspective, including the monitoring component. Um, and the conclusion for Plan 1 to Plan 5 under current conditions is essentially they're equivalent, $7 million to $7.1 million for the watershed as a whole. And on a equivalent annual cost basis, um, which would be uh, if you amortize the debt to an annual cost, the capital cost to an, to an annual cost, just to simplify the math, um, they're not quite as close, but they're still reasonably close to each other. In the future, you know, the, co the capital costs go up to $8 million and $8.4 million. Again, they're not dramatically different at this level of analysis. Um, so the, um, the maintenance costs are, are different between sewering and uh, an alternative IA system. So that's really the, the, the piece that needs to get fine-tuned in order to keep it cost-effective, Plan 5 cost-effective. But I guess the take-home is, as Eric said, it's either option's really in play for this watershed. And, and I guess if there are systems that can produce less than 10 milligrams per liter, then that, that would shake out through in it what, um, what the Mass Massachusetts Department of Environmental Protection terms an adaptive management process. So we're, we would propose to put these together in phases. Phase one, phase two, you would do monitoring in between to assess the effectiveness, and that would help you fine tune what needs to be done in later phases. So the next steps, um, get some input tonight, um, and then take good notes. And then we're going to basically sit back and wait for a couple of other important studies that, are, that the town are, is, is working on and hopes to finish by January of next year. Um, 
That will be the reassessment of whether capacity disposal capacity exists at the Blacksmith Shop Road treatment plant and uh, the actual monitoring results from the West Falmouth Harbor septic system pilot study. Uh, so this is data on alternative IA systems. Um, we need to do a little bit more work with DEP to, to affirm and, and fine tune the monitoring plan to make sure it's something that they, DEP can support ultimately in a permit. Um, we need to make sure that we account for the changes that have been implemented in the watershed since MEP did their work. In some cases, and this, was, this data goes back to 2003, 4, 5, I think. So there are some homes that have been built. Um, there are some systems that have been converted, I think, to maybe only one, to an IA system. Uh, there's been some stormwater improvements that have been made. There's been some fertilizer use changes that have been made in the watershed. And all that stuff needs to be identified so that we can take credit for it. Um, we need to, as I mentioned, develop the phasing plan and the monitoring plan and the schedule for how this thing would play out over time and then develop a draft report for the, for the committee to review. Obviously, we have some coordination with regulatory agencies. Um, so the timing would be to, to do an initial draft report next summer and a final draft report next December. So that's, that is it. Um, he, he's here to take questions. The committee is here to take questions or comments or whatever, whatever you have in mind. Uh, we'll start. I have a question. What happens to your advanced uh, individual system when you close the house for the winter? Uh, you'd have to go through a, um, like a mothballing process. And to some extent, it depends on the type of system. There are several. There's a uh, what we'll call a mechanical system approach, a system that might have some pumps and some motors and things that are electrical in nature that you'd need to get the water out of and mothball. Um, and then there are systems that are just natural gravity, maybe a little bit of chemical. Um, so you basically just have to have to winterize it. Uh, I heard that there was depending on on. The bacteria, and if it's unoccupied, there's nothing to feed the bacteria. That is true. So again, this, this comes down to a mechanical system versus a, a more, maybe a, a passive system. In the case of a mechanical system, you could have your maintenance guy go there a couple weeks before you intend to occupy the place and get the system going, kind of feed those bugs that, are, that have that bacteria that's gone dormant over the winter. Um, so that, that is something that you can do. It's called a, you'd call it startup. Um, but these are, these are realities that, that play into whether or not a system can, can um, any approach can meet a, a specific number. You know, my, my system can meet 10. Does it meet it every day? That's the, that's the thing that needs to get worked out. Sir. Yes, I didn't really understand the uh, cost of the IA system. Is that, could you explain what, uh, instead of estimated annual cost, what that cost is? Does, uh, have, what's the implication for those of us who have recently built co-compliant uh, uh, septic tanks? Can there be an add-on, or are we talking about a replacement? So those are my your, your three or four questions. Yeah. Why on the development of the demonstration project are you waiting to find out if it works? What does that mean? So, in terms of if you if you have a system that was recent, this gets into phasing and parts of the plan that we haven't really yet developed for the watershed. Um, but if if somebody had just spent a bunch of money to put in a new system, they probably wouldn't be on the first, the top of the list to replace that system. Um, there, there are approaches you could take where you would add on to your, to your recently upgraded system. It, you might have to pick something that is a little different. You might have a smaller suite of options available to you if you wanted to, to fully recapture the value of the system you have. Um, there's the capital cost that we've used in the plan is um, about $28,000, which is, again, it's a planning level number meant to represent any number of systems and the cost associated with installing it. Okay. I see. So that's just the amortized amount of the 
amount over So then that would be amortized and added to the annual O&M operations and maintenance and compliance costs. Those pieces together are the equivalent annual cost. By way of background, the experiment in West Falmouth basically involved 20 homes near the water, and they, they said to these homeowners, we'll give you $10,000 toward the cost of an add-on. Most, most, in most cases, it was a septic tank that was added on. Uh, what they found that was that the cost of the add-on and installing it was in the $20,000 range. The cost of repairing the damage to the lawn and the driveway and the, and the bushes and all that ranged all over the lot, depending on how many bushes and driveways you had. Uh, so that, that's the picture as we know it now. We're, we're, we're still experimenting with this. We've got 20 on the ground there now. We're putting in 10 more. There's some going in in the vineyard. Uh, the, the idea is to f not quite the holy grail here, but what you're, you're trying to find an add-on that's easy to use, works for seasonal homes as well as year-round homes, uh, and, and doesn't cost the homeowner at the end of the day any more than a sewer would. But that, that, that's the goal. <laughs> sure. Has reversion to a saltwater pond been considered, and what would be the arguments against that? That's somebody over here with yeah. you. Okay. <laughs> Not surprising. Right, right house. Yeah, we did the uh, management plan for uh, originally back in 98. When the year went in, there was a uh, three year period of dealing with system input, open meetings. And we went through that. And the problem is. Actually, I was on the board at the time and I recall it, but I don't recall. I was younger then. I'm sorry. <laughs> I thought there was something about a hearing. I will tell you the reason. Uh, okay. So what happened was that the um, <clears throat> we wanted to check out that because that'd be the cheapest way to do it, right? Yeah. But we can't keep it open. We can't even keep Trunk River open, and so it's just not a system that we can stay open. And then that's one thing. It would be 150, I think, meter or foot or whatever it is. A very long inlet for a tiny little pond. Now. The real thing is, is that when there's hurricanes, and we knew this back then, when there's major storms, salt water comes over Surf Drive and goes into Oyster Pond. So we made it a freshwater pond, everything would die. Because salt is, is a, a uh, you know, is, creates osmotic stress for real freshwater systems. So the decision was taken to make it between two and four parts per thousand. That would allow the shock value of a hurricane not to destroy the pond, and it would allow you to have a stable ecosystem. You get some salt water in, it's not going to destroy the pond. It might go up to four or five, six, doesn't matter. That's the reason. Okay? So that when you're living in treetops and you're looking down, it's not one year looking like a green sewer, and the next year it's looking, okay. yeah. Right. And the other problem is very fresh in these systems. When it's a little bit of salt, you get a lot of insects. There, there is another uh, added uh, technical uh, uh, that, that this, this gentleman was ahead of you. I think we'd John addressed that in those days and we were trying to get some of what to do. Could somebody uh, bring the microphone uh, around? Yeah, that's good. Uh, Thanks. Okay. <laughs> when we were trying back in the early days of OPET to decide what we should do, and one of the things we did consider was opening the pond. Yep. We surveyed the entire uh, population around the pond, asking them whether they would like to keep the ecology of the pond as it had been essentially for 75 years since the railroad was put in and the uh, entrance to the sound was blocked up. And the re re response was about 80% said absolutely keep the ecology as it is. We don't want the tidal issues. We don't want crab issues. We don't want a variety of other issues that will happen if, indeed, we open it to the sound. So uh, it's a different 20 years ago, we may want to do it again. But that was certainly the view then. Mm -hmm. Comments? Sir. Uh, you're good. Yeah, carry that over there. Uh, so this, this, is, this is for the TV people as well as for us. Okay, I'll try it again. I'll speak up. 
Uh, a question about the math. I need some help on the math. The load today is about four times the recommended level, right? The nitrogen load is about four times. If, if all of the properties were sewered, how close would that nitrogen level come down to the, require, the recommended level? If, if all of the sewer parcels were sewered, it would go below the level. Because um, okay. there's, well, one, there's one piece that I didn't show because it gets complicated, is there's a benthic flux component to the MEP analysis that I just excluded from that just for simplicity. Um, it, it is not, it's not shown in either graph. It's not shown in either pie chart. But it's a, it's a fairly significant component of both. Uh, and in, in the case of Oyster Pond, it's a, it's a net sink. So it's not, there are not circumstances where it's, uh, in the MEP analysis, where it's, where it's providing nitrogen to the water column. It's a sink. Well, uh, you know, sewage treatment is pretty well established and known. So we would have a pretty good idea of what would come out of it. I fall into the camp of, of the fierce urgency of now. And so is there not some way to move this forward? It seems to me that sewering is well understood, well accepted, and we know what the costs are. So uh, wh why the long, uh, another few years of analysis? The short answer is, <clears throat> right now, the town sewer plant cannot take any more sewage from anywhere, including Oyster Pond. Oh, I thought there was, it had some room. It has, the plant has capacity. What we don't have is discharge capacity. After, after the waste has come to the plant and been treated, you, you have water this, in great quantities that's low in nitrogen because it's been treated but it has to go somewhere. Uh, in the past, it has gone into West Falmouth Harbor, and that is no longer going to be available. Uh, this, this, the Heights of the Mara Vista added about 260,000 gallons a day, and the town acquired a piece of land near the plant as a discharge site for that amount of, of wastewater, treated wastewater. Uh, that's taken up. And there is no more land to be had, and nothing is going to be allowed to go into West Falmouth Harbor beyond what it already does. So the short answer is right now, and unless a new discharge site has been acquired and developed, the sewer option is not an option. You now the town is obviously looking to find additional discharge site capacity, but it's not there now. To answer the question of why we're not sewering now. Sure. Miss. My question is related to your estimates for future demand or future production of nitrogen. Do you include in that estimate population changes in terms of more full-time people living in the watershed area over the next 10, 20, 30 years? Yeah, we, we did. Yes, we did. Um, I don't recall the numbers off the top of my head, but we, we broke it down into development of vacant parcels and redevelopment of existing parcels to a more intensive use. In, in, so we did look at that across the watershed. And that's what totaled the 5,600 or so gallons per day of additional development or redevelopment in the watershed. Yes. Since we're talking about um, just, you know, a majority percentage needed re regardless of the plan, uh, what are some examples of the criteria that would be to choose whether you had to, you know, your home was included or not and having to sewer or in the other plan? And, and also tied with that, I just wanted to understand a little more when you're talking about an annual cost of over $3,000, was that assuming uh, amortization of 30 years, or? Uh, well, the second question, uh, you can't do, do too much with these numbers. They are, they are based on a whole pile of assumptions that have not been solidified yet, uh, including the question of how long you would amortize something. Can we borrow the money at 0% or can we not? 
uh, you know, big, big issues. I mean, that's a huge issue. Whether you're paying 0% or 2% or 5% on your money right. makes all the difference in all these costs. So, so you, really, it, it won't be profitable until we have more, more solid numbers to play with to get into the cost piece. But even the guesstimates, at least the guesstimates yeah. right now, are based on an amortization, though, in terms of X number of years. Yeah, there, well, the assumption yeah. is that we're borrowing it for 20 years from the state at 0%. Okay. Uh, the assumption is also that you're borrowing, if, if it was going to be the IA option, that you were borrowing it at 5% from the county, I believe was the other. Well, that may not turn out to be true at all because the county is borrowing it for zero and we're not going to have them borrow it for zero and, and try to charge you five. So we got a way to go on a, on a number of these assumptions. Uh, but, I think there's a confusion. I think I heard Doreen say 3,000 a year and so I suspect there's some scared people out there. Uh, I think that's a misinterpretation. Right. No one is proposing. High. That's way too high. Yeah. I, I, I think that number was up there but it was for something else. Yeah. I mean, you're talking about an IA system, the capital cost, to keep the numbers simple, right. is, is, say, $30,000. Right. Uh, Eric's right. It's all over the place because of the landscaping. But if you mortgage that for 30 years at zero interest, it's obviously $1,000 a year. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Does yeah. that include the maintenance costs, <clears throat> or is that just the cost of the Self. These numbers were intended to include, include everything uh, on both sides of the equation. With the sewer, it would include the betterment. It would include the, the sewer fee that you pay along with your water bill when you're hooked up to the sewer. Uh, with the IAs, it would include the monitoring. It would include coming around and pumping your system out every five years. It would include the whole package in both cases. The idea was to make the IA option as user-friendly as the sewer option is. So, so the premise would be the town and not the homeowner would be responsible for the maintenance, for the monitoring, for the pump out. And you would get a bill once a year like the people with the sewer do uh, for those same uh, <coughs> services. But, 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 wait, wait, but to answer that question, that simple math I did coming out with $1,000 a year, that was just for a capital cost of 30 k You'd have to add to that the annual fees for maintenance and inspection. And the other cost also about the criteria for selecting who would actually be impacted. Uh, to the extent there's been thinking about it is the closer you are to the pond, the, the, you should be sewered ahead of, or, or I aid, ahead of the folks who are not close to the pond. Hmm. Sure, John. It might be useful to give an example. We rebuilt our house beginning four years ago. We put in an IA system. It cost us approximately 20000 more to put in the IA system since we had to replace our whole septic system. Okay, so the first su summer that we were there, the nitrogen was down about 10 milligrams per liter. By the next summer it went down to five and we've been averaging about five cents. So we're half of what uh, is needed you know, to bring the nitrogen down appropriately in the pond. The first year the cost of, of uh, uh, monitoring the, the pond were considerable. There were about a thousand dollars. But that's dropped right off and now we're paying about three hundred, three hundred and twenty-five dollars once a year to have the system monitored. Okay, that's the experience we've had, and it have had no problem. It's the RUC system, by the way, and there are other systems that might even be better. Yeah. Question, yeah. comment. The, uh, for clarification only, the, uh, are you going to recommend, is there going to be a list of, of accepted vendors? In other words, you don't just to go and put out, pick anybody. Is there going to be a list for the public to pick from? Yes. 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 I, think I knew that. The, yeah, the, the question is, is there going to be a list of approved vendors of IA systems if, if we're going down the IA road? I think, you know, John has been working with the test center out in the, the Massachusetts test center on this very <clears throat> question. I mean, 
I think the way the direction they're going, you know, fill it in if you want. But they, the idea is they, we, there will be perhaps three options that get you to the 10 and that get to the level of maintenance and operation that is uh, desirable. And those three would be offered uh, to the homeowners. Is, is that fair? <laughs> the idea at the moment is not to say you can use system A, system B, or system C but to design a treatment chain which has certain criteria in that treatment chain and says that any vendor that meets that particular series of treatments uh, would be qualified to be eligible to install. Yeah. Wait, 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 wait. Yeah. Go for it, go for it. The, uh, <laughs> you have a, I don't quite know how, and nor do I care tonight, how you came up with the number of houses and things that would be sorted, but, or so IA, I'm more concerned, well, both. For the IA systems, given certain uncertainties, it's not, they're not sewers, as the gentleman back here said, are you planning on not trying to hit just the TMDL as stated in the DEP and EPA documents? You're at 175 about, and there's maybe going to be 243 someday. So have you thought of increasing it? Like some towns have, Chatham just sort everything, or is going to sort everything. You thought about adding on additional to take care of the fact that in your plan has to be the what do we do if things don't work option. So you're going to buffer yourself by adding in more more houses for IA to take care of that and the the thing you have to put in, which is that if it doesn't work, we will do this. But you wouldn't so, need to buffer. Can I that, Sure, go down. So. Um, there are a couple of things we're going to do. Obviously, if you're a seasonal house, you're getting nine months of total removal. Um, you'll have some IA systems, which like John Dowling's, are getting better than 10. Mm -hmm. And you're going to have a few that don't make the 10. But on average, you're going to be, as a community, getting less than 10. And so that's sort of the way we're, we're thinking about it. And the state has, I think, agreed to that in principle. Um, Chuck, seasonality of the homes was taken into account in the loading. Right. So the big fear was that people would go from seasonal to year round, and we couldn't see it. We have to reanalyze everything. So, so the fact that, that they're getting full removal doesn't matter because right now they're only getting credit for 25% or 30% additional load mm -hmm. compared to the guy next door who's there year round. So that's, that's take care of it. And the up and down thing is, yeah, you're right. Some do better, some do worse. The question is, how much effort are you going to put into proving that rather than putting in a few more systems so you don't have to beat yourself up because you're at 11, average of 10.5. Dealing with DEP all the time, that's the issue. Right. The, uh, DEP has been having this conversation back and forth. And when they first talked about IAs, they described it as a uh, a sewer, a sewer plant with 200 uh, pieces, <laughs> or however many pieces. Right. And we all held our heads and said, you know, this, how can this work? Well, here, here's how it can work. And, and they are on board with this, which is you can tell from the town water records how much water is passing through each individual home. And you will have at least an annual uh, test of the level of nitrogen that you're reaching. So from those two factors, you can tell how much nitrogen that, how, that, pond, that pond is receiving from that house. And technology is such that you can easily get the water readings, and you'll have the, the measurement of the nitrogen. So you will know how much you're putting in. So because of that, we've reached sort of an understanding with them that we can do this in phases. That if we want to start with 145 homes and see how it goes, that's fine. And if, if we have to go to a phase two because we're not reaching the target, we will go to phase two. Uh, but that's, that's the adaptive management idea. Try it. See if it works the way you thought it would. And if it does, declare victory. If it doesn't, do some more. Uh, so so right, these numbers, like every other number here, are, are, are in flux. Oh, yeah. and, and but it's a safety factor question. We, we, exactly. Anything does it, that water use. Sure. Yeah. Um, 
my question was partially answered by this last discussion. Uh, the, the question was, who uh, uh, warranties the performance of these? Is it the town who develops the list? Is it the fellow that, or the people that install it? Or is it the owner? Uh, how does that work? If, if, you know, if you're, these seem to be uh, new systems. If, if it just doesn't work, who, who fixes that? The, the idea is that the town would do an RFQ and hope for two or three or more uh, vendors to respond. For them to be successful respondees, in addition to having a reasonable price, they have to show that they're uh, licensed, bonded, and insured, and have appropriate local service people. One of these companies is in Montana. Um, and um, does that answer your question? I mean, no, the no. companies have to. They have to make a the companies have to warrant them. Okay. Um, so can I comment? Yeah. One of the issues that we've been struggling with at the moment is there are no state criteria for failure of an IA system. Basically, the state says, "Hey, you know, if you want 50% removal, it should get 19 milligrams per liter." But nobody comes along and says, "If you're not making 19." that you have to do anything. So what the Board of Health is at the moment working on is a, sa a set of failure criteria for IAs. In other words, we're going to say if, you put in a, if a vendor puts an IA system in, it gets tested uh, quarterly for two years. Uh, if you meet the standard, uh, you can get a reduction in testing, which is what John Dowling was talking about from quarterly measurements down to one per year. But then we're saying, hey, if, if uh, your system begins to fail, we're going to make you fix it. And we're now setting up the criteria that will uh, be used to do that. And so we would be holding uh, each of these. The, the problem with IAs, it's the biggest challenge, is that instead of one sewer, big sewer treatment plant, which we're monitoring every week, we now have, for the point of discussion, 200 individual little treatment systems, mm -hmm. which we have to persuade the state are operating at a level that is going to meet that TMDL and Oyster Pond. And that's a real challenge, and it's a, it's a challenge that the town is not anxious to take on. In other words, the DPW has enough trouble managing one big treatment plant. There, if, if all of a sudden in Little Pond, where we had 1,600 units that we dealt with, if we had 1,600 IAs, that's a maintenance nightmare for the town. So these are all the issues when we weigh IAs against sewer that become critical. And we're grappling now with how to deal with each of those problems. Oh. What, one thing that, that we didn't mention with the fellow in the back here who said, well, sewers are a known commodity. We have a sewer plant. What's the problem? Uh, if there were sewering in this oyster pond watershed, it, it would not be gravity sewers. Uh, you kind of right. mentioned that, but I don't think the implication was that clear. It would not be gravity sewers because you're pumping uphill. Uh, what it would be is the, the kind of uh, installations that 700 of the people in the Heights in Mara Vista installed, which is basically what they call them grinder pumps or low pressure pumps. Uh, you, you, the wastewater comes out of your house, it goes through this pump. This pump pushes it to the street and pushes it <laughs> to where it needs to go. Uh, the town in those areas, and presumably anywhere else, bought the pumps, gave them to the homeowner, said, you put them in. It's yours. If, if, if you put GI Joe down the toilet and it blocks it up, it's your problem. <laughs> uh, so you're not scot off scot-free by, by thinking sewers are it, because uh, like I say, a gravity sewer would be different. But the, these kind of sewers do involve a mechanical device on your property that has a shelf life, uh, that doesn't work when the electricity goes off. I mean, there, there are factors that, that make it less than perfect, too. Yeah. 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 I just want to clarify that back of the envelope mortgage figure that I gave you, 30,000 divided by 30 and got 1,000. Uh, that's before the 30% reimbursement by the town. 
so you're down to of the order of 700 a year. But this is back of the envelope. Yeah, we're, I'm just we're, showing we're, you the principle. We're all around here. We've all worked on the assumption, because this is what works in West Falmouth, that you cannot ask the homeowners to put it in an IA and pay for it all themselves. In West Falmouth, the town bonus, or this, in that case, the state bonus, was $10,000 toward the cost. And I think we're, we're thinking that that would be probably what you would do wherever you put the IAs in, that, that there would be a public subsidy of, in, in that amount, which is the 30% right. that, uh, that John, uh, Steve's talking about. By the way, the IA is per unit, even in tree tops, where you know, like now we have a septic that goes across several no. units. No, tree tops, yeah. tree tops has different options. I don't know whether the town would do it or whether tree tops would do it separately. But in principle, and I'm not a civil engineer. Ed, Ed may be able to tell you, or you hire him on, on your time later on. But, um, uh, you could, you now have about 62 units, uh, living units, and 31 septic systems in pairs. You could do it that way, or you could have one big one at the bottom of your hill, or two or three of them, and my. Other kind of engineering knowledge tells me there might be an economy of scale. Yeah. Certainly, there should be in the monitoring, because there, now there's going to be one thing to monitor. Mm -hmm. And, and the, the problem of poisoning your system with bleach would be greatly reduced because you're not all going to pour a gallon of bleach in the same day. And um, <laughs> I hope. <laughs> and um, uh, and um, so you'd have to look into that. And from the town standpoint, we don't care as long as you get the nitrogen out of it. Yeah. And the bleach. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Bill. Yeah. Um, the, the flow. Oh, oh, Mike. Mike. Hi. OK. The flow uh, consideration that John was talking about per system times concentration gives you the flux, which fits with Brian's initial purposes for Oyster Pond. It was interesting, though, in Brian's MEP analysis, which has been great, is that actually he found the flow per resident area being much higher here in Oyster Pond than was found in other areas. However, to be conservative. He, they adopted the little pond um, uh, flow of uh, which then leads you to your, if you mass out on the flux, to about 10 pounds <coughs> per resident per, per year. However, if you use that flow, your total uh, mass per resident would be more like 20. And, and that's significant from a standpoint. I don't think you will find it at 20. I think it's going to be in between those yeah, let's, two. Let's let that answer that. And here's, here's the question associated with it, though. Because if you use the, the in between the 10 and the 20, you end up for your IA units of being more like 160 instead of the 240. And if you phased, as you're saying, if you're phasing it to look at those different components, you'll know right. what you're going to be finding along that line. So uh, I just wondered if you could have any more details on what you were thinking about in terms of actually phasing approaches. Sure. Um, you, you bring up a lot of good points. And we've chatted about this in the past as well in terms of what are the septic effluent concentrations and the leach field effluent concentrations and <clears throat> the overall loads. Um, there's definitely a lot, there's a lot to it, to that, to what systems can produce for effluent. And ultimately, you're trying to get to a TMDL level that, that meets the water, water quality objectives. So in terms of phasing, we definitely would want to proceed in phases. And in terms of phasing, we, we haven't had specific discussions yet on how many phases that would be. Um, but it would need to be programmed out over time. And certainly, the highest priority would be any homes that are within the 10-year travel time, which are pretty much any property that has frontage. There's probably a handful of others that don't have frontage on the pond that are still within the 10-year travel time. 
um, and then you would work outward from there. So those, that's really, it's honestly as far as we've gotten, but it, because that's really, we, we aren't developing phasing plans for six alternatives or two alternatives. We're gonna develop a phasing plan for the selected alternative and just have it be clear. Yeah, particularly the question sometimes comes up with the 24 to 23 units that are up in Greengate or 3,000 feet away from the pond, which various people have even distributed the Chesapeake study on that that says that your likelihood of impact on pond from over 3,000 feet away is gonna be pretty small. Right, and certainly those folks wouldn't be that would be illogical to have that be phase one. Um, it's also, you know, the way the watershed divides the street, there'd be home, there are homes on those streets in three different watersheds. So that's kind of a global macro, how does the town want to deal with any particular street, or how does Oyster Pond fit in with the strategy for Quisset Harbor and Salt Pond, but logically those would happen later in a phasing plan. Gentlemen in blue. Yeah, I'm and the lady. Uh, I think they have electronic uh, toilets that can just de demolish everything, put it in the air. Now, what happens with that? That would just bypass the whole thing. And we used to put all the garbage into the stove, and that disappeared. Now, is this going to com compound the pond or not? Uh, this committee spent a lot of time over the years looking at alternative toilets, as you described. And uh, I'll, I'll give you the bottom line was consumer acceptability was not there. Uh, we, we got a special act passed by the legislature that said in Falmouth, in, in the Heights Mara Vista sewer service area, if any of the residents there wanted to skip paying the $16,000 betterment, all they had to do was put in one of the toilets you described. And we sent that in a letter to, to all 1,600 homeowners in the area. And uh, none of them did it. Would, would the nitrogen disappear if you electronically it? Well, we're never going to find out. <laughs> <laughs> because nobody wanted to do it. So it, it, it fell off of our radar screen as an option. If somebody in one of these sewer service areas wants to, or if somebody in this area wants to, and they can show that it's going off to the air and it's not contributing to the pond, I'm sure we'll have a provision that allows such a thing. But our experience, and we pushed pretty hard on, on trying to get people interested, was that they were not interested. <coughs> Lady back there. Half of what I wanted to ask was just asked, asked and answered. Uh, the other half is reduction of the source of wastewater by altering the regulations in relation to gray water, say what comes from your washing machine, from the shower, <laughs> uh, and diverting it into your lawn. Has this been factored in? We, we have another expert present. Uh, Mike McGrath has an answer for you. Uh, I'm Mike McGrath. I'm a citizen of Falmouth and West Falmouth. I'm also an expert at removing nitrogen from water. Uh, that was actually discussed at a Board of Health meeting, and I wrote a vociferous opposition in that there are fecal coliforms in gray water, and we should not be just um, using gray water for fertilization. It's a well known in the industry. So uh, I also operate 100 systems of all types, and uh, there's absolutely no enforcement for the IA systems at the moment. So perhaps the, there's no enforcement at the state level. Um, IA system, I had one discharge, 90 milligrams per liter. That's almost impossible with the model. I sent it up saying, let's see what happens. Nothing. So the town, I've recommended to the town they have enforcement and they need to get the right kind of operators. Uh, an operator can make almost any system work. Okay. Sir. When you're talking about the phasing. Yep. <clears throat> Hang on, we got a mic for you. Thank you. When you're talking about the phasing, uh, is it possible or practical to think about some sort of a moratorium on additional building that could be uh, introduced uh, to stop the future growth? 
Bush no. Done too. No. <laughs> <laughs> no. If someone owns a buildable lot, uh, you can't stop them from building on it. At you one, can't, at, you can't put on at one point, at one point, the, ta the town did have a cap of 300 units per year, uh, but that was a long time ago, and, and we have not come near 300 units a year in a very long time. So, uh, but you could put on additional requirements in, in it, it, if we building. if right. we went with IAs, right. and you reached, you did phase one or phase two, and you reached equilibrium. The obvious thing would be that any new buildings would also have to have an IA, so you didn't fall behind the curve. Mm -hmm. You're right. That 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 certainly could be yeah. part of part of a, a regulatory scheme uh, for for new construction. Right. The way in the back. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate all this. Um, I have a question that I know my house will not be able to be sewered. It's just too far away. Um, so. I need the other system. And I'm waiting to find out which one will work. We all are. <laughs> um, but I also have a question about uh, will it be considered how much frontage you have, how many people you have in the house, that sort of thing. Like I, I have one, two people in the house maybe three months out of the year. Um, but you know, is that going to be factored in? If, if, if it's a sewer. You have a house, you hook up. Doesn't matter how many bedrooms, whatever. If it's an IA, you, you put in an IA, uh, no matter how many bedrooms you have. Uh, no, I guess I'm talking about for the town. You know, um, for all of Oyster Pond, some areas in Oyster Pond have a lot more effluent than other areas. Um, is that going to be factored in? Like, um, for example, will the treetops need a better system or sewering, whereas uh, some of the summer homes just get the IA system or whatever. I mean, they're obviously going to have to be two different systems because some of these areas can't be sewered. I can't even get natural gas at my house. I, I don't think I'm going to get a sewer line there. Well, ultimately, it comes down to what plan is selected by the town. With uh, and <clears throat> for a sewer, you would if. if the sewer line was run to your home, the incremental cost you would pay related to how much use there was would be paid through the sewer bill, how much water you use. For an IA system, you would need to size the system based on the number of bedrooms in your home, and that's what would govern. So a home that has five bedrooms would have a more expensive IA system than a home that has two. And that's how the, that's how the cost would differ, but the town wouldn't set up different performance requirements for different parcels within a watershed. And the only other question I have is, besides the fact that it would be nice to know if oysters would really work again, but um, what about the, fer I mean, the fertilizer is not that big of an issue compared to the effluent, but what about trying to make some, in the, while we're waiting, trying to make some sort of regulations that have teeth because people are pouring fertilizer on their lawns around the oyster pond and it just is not stopping. On the fertilizer, we, we passed a special act for the legislature that said certain times in the year and that kind of thing. But it also said if you're any property within 100 feet of, of one of these water bodies cannot fertilize at all in that 100-foot zone. And I appreciate that, but I can tell you for a fact People? that there are multiple different landscapers that come from off Cape to fertilize right. within 100 feet. You, all around that you, pond. You, you're probably right. We send letters out to all the landscapers. We send letters out to all the property owners in the whole town every year saying, here's the bylaw, here's the enforcement. Uh, but, but you're right. People, so there's people no will real, do it. No real answer to that. I mean, because that, that would make a difference in the meantime. Well, it, it would. If, if, uh, I'm not sure we're, we're, uh, what we could do. We don't have fertilizer police, and we're not going to hire any. I, I, oh, okay. It's a, it's a, well, you've got one right you're, here. You're absolutely right. A, <laughs> <laughs> don't worry. Yeah, I'm scared. In the back. Away. <laughs> yes. I'm a little uncertain of what uh, the choice. This is a choice of the Falmouth uh, government as to whether it's going to be sewer or we would have to do IA, right? And so that yeah. means the Falmouth government would have to choose to create new discharge uh, venues. So is that even a possibility? Is there really a choice here, or is it inevitably an IA well, system? The, the choice today 
is neither, <laughs> for, for a couple of reasons. Reason number one, if you're thinking a sewer is the right way to go, the town doesn't have the discharge capacity to do that. If you're thinking IAs is the way to go, we haven't found the three or, or, or however many uh, IA units that meet the standard you want to meet. And, and the state hasn't done it, and the town hasn't done it. So you have, <laughs> you have time in both cases. The third reason you have time is that either one of these is going to cost money. And the town just spent 100 million bucks last year on water filtration plant and on the 1,650 sewer units in uh, the Heights of Mira Vista. So the, the, uh, our policy from day one has been we're not going to recommend anything to the selectmen or to the town or to anybody else that involves raising the taxes. We're not stupid. So until the town has a window of opportunity, in other words, old debt being paid off, therefore new debt could be acquired, neither one of these is going to be happening. That next window is 2025. So between now and 2025, there will be a lot of planning. There will be some designing. There will be some choices being made. Hopefully there's, there will be a discharge site identified and acquired or paid for, whatever. All these things need to happen before either of these options becomes a reality. So, uh, you know, don't write your check yet. <laughs> Ron, Ron's wife. Thanks, sir. I have a question for Ed, actually. You know, when you started this process, we're looking at IAs, and then we have had recently had the project in West Falmouth, with West Falmouth Harbor, and put in, as Eric pointed, 20 systems. My understanding is about half of those are tight tanks. So has that factor been put? Tight tank is basically a tank that all of your wastewater goes into and stays there. And then you pump it out and take it somewhere. Okay, so it's not, you don't have machinery or anything. You just have a bathtub, a <laughs> big yeah. bathtub in the ground. But the thing is that, uh, has that been, is that one of the options that was looked at as an IA and, and whether it could, it could be taken not that, to? That as an option has very limited utility. It was used in West Falmouth Harbor for those old summer houses that were stick-built houses. Most of them don't even have plaster walls where they could reconfigure the plumbing easily. They were occupied for two months of the year. They could put in a holding tank with an overflow into a normal, so they were really just Title V systems that short-circuited the black water. So for people who are living in year-round houses, that simply is not a, a reasonable right. option. Well, well, but they, they worked well in that very specific, small 1890s summer colony where people were coming down for eight weeks in the summer they could get away with a 2,000 gallon pipe tank and pump it once or twice a season. For I mean, someone with a seasonal home where you can't redo the plumbing and separate the gray from the black water, uh, it's simply not an option. I'm just thinking in terms of phasing, that there might be some homes that are sort of that two month a year use. We still have to take it somewhere. You know, we can't take it so much to West Falmouth even, right? But I don't know if the base has capacity. I don't know where it might go. But, but that could be a phasing thing that if it is a seasonal thing, it is a few weeks. And then, uh, and then uh, it, it can be taken somewhere where it wouldn't have an impact. It's just another thing to put in. It might be 10% of the houses. But that, would be, that could be a relatively cost effective thing. It could be more. I don't know. But the issue with that is the plumbing in the house has to be of such a nature that you can easily separate the gray water sources from the black water toilets. And that normally means a fairly extensive replumbing of the entire house. For a typical house that you have in the Oyster Pond watershed, that just is not a reasonable option. Okay, I just want to clarify two things. First, uh, on the sewers, keep in mind that from one of Eric's slides, there were a bunch of other estuaries that are much, have much bigger watersheds than Oyster Pond that can only be done with sewers. So the town has to solve the affluent problem for those. If and when it does, Oyster Pond is a drop in the bucket by comparison. The second is um, I'm legally not allowed to specify vendors, so one pointed at the treetops. 
You don't have to hire Ed. You can hire Mike McGrath. Or <laughs> Who? Yes, well, that is true. Did he, did he say it like you told us? Yeah. <laughs> or, or any other civil engineer. Or which right. person? Okay, Wendy. Yeah. Oh, sure. Where'd you go? Here. Hi, I just wonder if you could elaborate a little bit on um, exactly what um, things you're going to be looking at to reassess what the actual load is in the pond? I mean, how, how are you going to do that? Um, I'm just question. curious, what, what factors are they going to look at to reassess what the actual load is currently into the pond? What the, the approach to that would be to, to identify what changes have been made in the watershed. I, I've, it's my understanding that there have been some fertilizer changes at some places in the watershed to try and figure out what those changes in loading are and then quantify that. Uh, we know that some stormwater modifications have been made, so look at the, identify the acreage of area that's been changed, look at what the best management practice was that was used and quantify that. Um, look at how many homes were built since the MEP data set was established and quantify that. So it's, it's a, all we can do, right, we're, yeah. we're just trying to, to identify and get a handle on what has changed since the MEP data set so that ultimately when we do, uh, generally we, a community would work with MEP to conf do a con what's called a confirmatory model to make sure that the recommended plan is gonna achieve the criteria. And when we did that, we would wanna give Brian our updated water use data, uh, our assessment of what's changed in the watershed so that that model is most effective. So that's, it's really, going through and identifying the laundry list of things that have changed. We're not going to go do water quality, yeah. Sam yeah. water sampling yeah. to, okay. to redo yeah. the whole thing. So you uh, anticipate getting that sometime by the winter, those numbers? I have no idea. I have, we have, well, we have to talk about yeah. schedule. <laughs> we have to talk beyond tonight. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, the, but I'm just, again, trying to get a handle on what the timeline is to when you will be making a decision between these two plans. You're thinking well, it would be... It has to be by December well, let's, next let's year. Let's be clear. We, we are not making any decisions about any plans. What, he's doing his best to provide real numbers about these options. The committee will make a recommendation to the selectmen. So it's the selectmen, selectmen who actually The make selectmen it. will decide what goes into the okay. comprehensive wastewater management plan that Ed is being paid to produce. Uh, and then that will go up to the state and they will have a dialogue about the validity of the choice the selectman made and it goes from there. But the time frame on that is next summer we'll have a draft, next December we'll have a final version into the state. So, so, so the planning part is not way off in the future, it's within a year. Uh, the implementation part clearly is beyond that. Yes. My question is also a timeline question. Um, you may not be able to answer this, but from start to finish, if whether it's option one in sewer, whether it's option two IA, um, how long would it take to complete the project? IA, uh, as we talked about, a three-year window. Something of that order. In other words, there there are not enough installers in town that if we decide we're going to put 170 units in Oyster Pond, we can't say by next April 30th, we want all 170 of those installed. So we would give you a window, and that's what they've done in Little Pond. Uh, again, once that sewer was ready to go, uh, they gave those people a, a window of opportunity to get hooked up. And so the, there would be a cushion. <clears throat> Uh, e whether it's a sewer or whether it's uh, IAs. And if I could just comment on what Eric said about, so next December we have to submit to the state a plan, a CWMP plan, of how we think we're going to proceed. I believe it's sort of the thought of the committee that both the options that we've presented tonight are viable. We're going to present both of those to the state uh, the state will probably say okay to both of those. And if once the funding becomes available in 2025, that's when we have to make the hard decision about, 
Are we going to go with IAs or are we going to go with a sewer? And that will be dictated by the availability of, of discharge sites for the main treatment plant and an acceptable management plan and acceptable IAs that meet their criteria that we want uh, for the IAs. So that decision is going to be a way down. So just to follow on, um, the three years would be for the entire Oyster Pond watershed, or you said you were going to do it in phases. Would individual phases take, obviously, less time? We, there'd be a phase with a window to get it installed. We then see what happened, how they performed. Then we decide, OK, we need to do phase two. And we would say that. And then the phase two people would also have a window uh, in which they would have to install them. There'd have to be a substantial period of time between phase one and phase two because the data is so noisy that it takes several years to find it and the travel time. You, you don't know instantly. Thank you. Sure. Yeah. There's no possibility that one could have both. In other words, what worries me is why is that? Oh, well, uh, it would cost twice as much as yeah. doing one or the other. <laughs> <laughs> To, to make everybody put an IA right. in and then a sewer? No, 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 no. Oh, I see. Oh, oh, I see. Sewer part of the area and IA the other part. I think that's a perfectly reasonable. That, yes. that could be. The yeah. option for us to consider when we get to that stage. What worries me is we're rebuilding houses all the time. Yeah. They're costing a very large amount of money. Right. Our house costs a fair amount of money. So that uh. adding the IA system to our total bill for the new house it was really peanuts. But I see people saying, well, until a decision is made, I'm not going to do it. Mm -hmm. And that, I think, is too bad. Mm -hmm. Because I think if we could encourage people right now to put in IA systems and to say, you're not going to lose all your money, that would be very helpful in beginning the process of reducing nitrogen in oyster pond, which is what we all want to have happen. You're, you're absolutely right. The, the problem with that is if the choice in the end is sewers, then all the people who put those IAs in have just wasted their money. <laughs> well, you, you can't run a sewer line down a street. At least we have never seen one. Uh, I know they talk about checkerboarding, but. Uh, well, I mean, natural gas. We called the gas company yeah. and said, "Will we put in a line down to our house?" They said, "Yeah, for $100,000." Yeah. So we said, "Forget it. We're right. going to put, a, we're going to put, you know, uh, mm -hmm. solar panels on the roof, which has been very successful." So some people came along, eventually got together, and they did put mm -hmm. a gas line in. But we don't have it. Why do we have to have a sewer if we already have okay. a system that's working? I get you. The problem with sort of saying I roll ahead with the IA is, is there is no regulatory scheme in existence for IAs. We're working on one. The first one ever to be prepared and approved is going to come from Falmouth. I know that right now. But it's not there yet. And if people just put them in on their own, like you did, that's terrific for the pond. But it doesn't answer the regulatory re requirement that, that you produce a plan that's going to deal with the whole watershed and, and, and all that. And, and so, another thing is if, if, if we say that a certain number of people can put in IAs, suppose we said that tonight. We're, we don't have any authority to do that. Suppose we did. Um, and then as the whole process went, uh, went through its paces, um, it was determined that DEP wouldn't allow IAs as a solution. What do we say to those people that we said, you'll be OK putting in IAs? In other words, it's not entirely in our hands. If, if IAs were disallowed for whatever reason, right. but I think we all agree in the room, I think you can certainly back me up, that as time goes on, they're becoming better and better and yep. better. Right. And uh, you know, it, 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 it's crazy not to encourage people to do it right now. One, interest rates are very low, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. So you're absolutely right. And IAs, you saw the list of the water bodies in this town that, that will not be getting a sewer. I mean, that's about nine of them. We have to do something in those water bodies, and it's going to involve IAs in every one of them. 
So IAs will happen. But if you've ever dealt with the state of Massachusetts, especially the Department of Environmental Protection, you will, you will find that your idea of time frame and your idea of regulatory rush is not theirs. And we're, we're encountering this. Our goal is to put a regulatory scheme in place for IAs that they will like. And frankly, we're, we're thinking Oyster Pond as sort of the model because we've got Ed working on it and, and that. We're going to get that model to them probably a year from now in, in that submission. And then they're going, to, they're going to have to say at that point, yes, this is an option and, and we're okay with how you're working it. Or yes, it's an option, but we need some tweaks. Or no, it's not an option. And then they've got a bigger problem than all of us because then, the, then they have precluded the most practical option for most of these water bodies. So I don't think they're going to say that. But we, we have to sort of tee it up for them because uh, they're waiting on us. Sure. Um, Eric, I understand everything you just said, but I just want to point out uh, something which obviously you guys know. Uh, treetops is roughly a third of the watershed. We have 40-year-old septic systems. Uh, we maintain them rigorously. But if in the next seven years we start having problems, you'll have 62 housing units that have to make a decision about where to go. And I would hope that the town would kind of have that in their mind as they move forward here. I mean, to the individual homeowner, it's not any different. But having some handful of homeowners who uh, you know, decide to risk putting in a, uh, an IA system, hoping that it'll be approved, um, is different than treetops or some other, you know, large community doing that. So, uh, and that's something we could realistically face. Mm -hmm. It's just, so, wanted to have that on the record. The Board, the board of Health uh, in the past has, has been flexible. I think, you know, one of the things which you're trying to do the state has permitted these IA systems typically at 19 milligrams per liter. The back of the envelope calculation was that that would provide a 50% removal of nitrogen. Um, it turns out that those assumptions were pretty faulty. Mm -hmm. And so what we're trying to do now is identify a suite of treatment systems, and that's what the experimentation in West Falmouth has been working on that will meet the criterion that we think will help the watersheds. So if we're installing what's permitted now by the state, which is 19 milligrams per liter, we can't get there from here. They don't do it. So until we can guarantee that there are systems out there that make 10, uh, it's not worth spending $30,000 on. Um, so we just need to get to that. And the vendors have had no reason to push the envelope because the state has said, hey, if they make 19, 50% removal, that's fine. What this community is saying is that standard no longer is going to cut it for us. Um, you're going to need to get 75% removal if you want to install your systems in our town. And so that's what we're working toward now. And until we get that sorted out, uh, running around willy-nilly putting in systems that meet 19, is going to cost the homeowner a lot of money, and it's not going to get the job done. Any other questions? Uh, we've, uh, we've kept you sitting here for an hour and a half, and we, we appreciate the interest. Obviously, what you think is the most important thing we want to hear about uh, tonight, and, and we appreciate it. Brian, do you want to say something? One final comment. We bet Quaker Pond is really lucky because of the short groundwater travel time, right? Yeah, so, so ultimately, it's quick enough if you start storing half the homes that you're going to uh, not store, uh, IA or store, whatever it is, in, the, in that near travel time, we'll be able to detect it in the pond within five years. So, so and, and the, the real TMDL does not say you have to hit that number. It says you have to hit that number or prove that the pond is restored. So if you restore the pond, you may never have to do phase two and three. So I would say keep built that in your plan mm -hmm. that we'll do this and we'll check and we'll do this. That's the real adaptive management is to get rid of those final steps. 
this is one of the few systems I've seen on Cape Cod where you could actually do that just because travel times, and 50% of that residential load is within probably five years. The yep. cautionary note here is that we anticipated there would be a seven year travel time in West Falmouth <laughs> from our upgraded sewer plant to the harbor. It's now been 13, 13 years, yeah, about. And, and we haven't yet seen that. We've done the second experiment with Little Pond. It, like Oyster Pond, is going to have a, should have a very short travel time. So that once those 1,600 houses are hooked up, we should see an impact pretty quickly. And if we don't, we need to do some real <laughs> You're thinking, right? Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? If not, thank you very much for coming. We appreciate it.